Ryan here, and I'm here with the Viking sword and the spear, the one-handed spear. The techniques that I use where I do the overarm throwing slide, and we're comparing it to Roland Warzeka's cast blow. The cast blow is basically where the sword is accelerated and thrown with the arm. It's not even necessary to use the entire body to generate energy. Just the, just the arm and slight uh, initial body movements. That's about it. You're just accelerating the blade, letting the blade do the work and follow through the target using the back of the hand to grip tightly and the uh, pommel on the back with the fingers tightly grasped and loose in the front allowing it to just flail out and kind of do its own cutting while you control it from the back and letting it do its thing. The overarm throwing slide that we're speaking of uh, is where you actually throw the spear but catch it. You don't allow it to fly to your hand. You allow it to slide through the hand and the thing about it, it's loose. It's not you going out there and gripping tightly and planting the legs and using the body to drive it home. You get more reach with it, plus you can fight in closer with it if necessary. But I mean, you get extreme reach and can just pull it right back. I mean, so it's a beautiful technique. It has a lot of power to improve and it has more penetration, initial penetration, when you're trying to penetrate layers of armor, let's say be leather or gambeson or, or what have you. Uh, most of these techniques here, the cast blow, the throwing slide, this was used for a long time, according to a lot of the uh, depictions that Roland sent me. Uh, later century was still used. I believe it was used in the ancient uh, warfare. When you go back to Bronze Age, I believe they were doing the throwing slide. I think the javelin and the spear were very hard to distinguish. But the main point today uh, is the actual technique with the sword of the cast blow and the cast or thrown blow of the spear, but the controlled uh, use of it behind a shield in early combat was probably the uh, common method of use because you're allowing the weight of the weapon to do the work and not actually using the body to deliver the blow. Later on when they get into uh, conventional, conventional fencing you'll see a lot of the uh, screening type cuts uh, you will see uh, other type of techniques but a lot of that was uh, bluff fetched in or, or armless com uh, unarmored combat where in ar lightly armored combat or armored combat with shields much easier to use the uh, cast blow or the overarm throwing slide or the slide. From mounted, I think it way, way later century, the actual cast blow because it's not the only method of use setting on a horse or possibly the shield wall where one can't move around a lot. Uh, you don't have the advantage to step every time you use the entire body. And that's when the weight of the weapon and accelerating it is a major advantage and it's effortless. It is not as tiring. But anyway, let's start with the video and compare them and see how they uh, stack up. All right, we're comparing the cast blow to the overarm uh, throwing slide. I always put the throw part in there because basically you're accelerating the weapon, meaning the weapon is, is the weight of the actual weapon is generating the energy and how fast you can accelerate it. And of course, how most people cut targets like this, they will use the uh, best portion of the blade, uh, which in this, this sword would probably be somewhere between here where it has the best cutting ability, which is also the fastest moving part of the blade if one accelerates it. If one accelerates the blade by swinging it, that is going to be the fastest moving area. But what Roland speaks of is how they used to grip it. This one's a little bit longer than it actually should be. But as you see, my little finger, my pinky, is right here on the inside of the pommel. I believe it's a type S pommel, but it's, it's on the inside of it. It's not out here. I believe, uh, 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 I don't know who it was. I think uh, Matt Easton had showed him doing it something like that, which is an exaggerated, ridiculous thing. You could not even do that with this one. But this back part of the hand, even like uh, Matt Easton says, is supposed to be held tight. In other words, the back part of the hand tightens up as the blade is cast, but the front of the, the fingers are held loose. So you end up in this kind of position, like you see in some of the drawings. But it's actually an ending position for the actual cast of the blow. But it's actually an effortless blow, and what we'll do here is try it out on this medium. We've got a rolled wet newspaper. And Cut very nicely, and we got a clean cut, clean through, and it didn't take much effort at all. All I did is use my arm motion, and I'm standing in a back stance as if I had my shield out, and I had to come in and cut. That means I could have something out here protecting me, and still throwing a proper motion, a cutting technique that will cut and be very effective, and have lots of power without uh, stepping, not doing a stepping cut, not doing a push cut, or say a uh, slicing type drawing motion. Most people would expect, and you have maximum reach. 
I'm gonna try one more here. Just a second. And it cuts effortlessly. All I'm doing is letting the blade do its job. That's, it. that's, that's all we're doing. We're just letting the blade come on down and cut. It, it's not a technique uh, like a push cut. Be trying to cut into it, which will not work on this medium very well, as we can just see. Or be trying to do something like cut into it. Because if I try to do that, this kind of medium is going to give. I'm not able to get that type of uh, cut in. Although I did cut into it, you can see that. I stepped in and just really cut into the actual medium, which is interesting. Proper push cut of. I mean, I can cut into the material, but I'm not going to get that kind of cut. And if I was hitting something like really thick armor, such as uh, uh, leather over a gamison cloth or multiple layers of cloth, uh, I don't think I would cut through much more than cloth trying to do that. I probably wouldn't even make it more cloth. But as you see, the fibers here we cut, I mean, that's beautiful. We could cut it anyway the same way. And even at the last bit there, we still cut through totally even after it was weakened. And that's effortless. You just sit here, just let the blade do its job. All right, we're going to talk about using it with a shield. The same idea, the cast blow and just following the shield line. Because you can do that in all manners here. You can just follow the shield line and come in and attack the target. Which is a good thing. Because you've got that to protect your hand, the shield, and to protect your body depending on where you're behind it. You're not going to always want to step out to cut from the shield. Because if you do that, you can get uh, attacked pretty much and injured trying to do that. You can stand in a front stance and do the same thing with the shield. You can attack that way and this way. So it's up to you if you're standing in this kind of a more behemoth style uh, buckler stance. You can stand in the back stance which you'll also see a lot of the old drawings. It, show, it shows up as well. But let's say I'm just using my arm and I'm back here with the shield. Let's see how effectively it cuts. Beautifully. It goes clean through, and all I'm doing is letting the sword do the work. I'm not, I'm not sitting here trying to do a body style cut where I'm holding the sword and uh, doing that. Because if I did that and try to put body and step into it and cut, we'd get an effect just like this. And that's, that's what we were trying to uh, show. Yes, I can do faster body motion, I can step in quicker and try to cut like I just did, but it's not going to work on this kind of medium. Effortlessly. And we got through this big roll. Look how big this roll is. Come on, check, check it out. That was effortlessly. I looked over at the camera and uh, look at this. A little tearing on the back, but that's actually how the stuff rolled. It unrolls as it comes through. This is what's causing the tearing. The actual cutting where it's densely rolled is all beautiful. That was me not even making any effort. I just let the blade do the work and accelerated it, and that's what it did. And that was another effortless cut. Come check it out, guys. Not much trouble there. That is a lot of newspaper, too. We've got over three inches. That's about three and a half inches. These old one-handers that are blade-heavy and the heavier models, cast like that, do way more damage. I think it's why in 13th century they had a lot of heavier one-handers because they were wearing a lot of armor. A lot of them were still using shields. And the cast blows work very well from mounts. Because if I'm, if I'm mounted, I can't move my body much. I can hold tight to the, the horse and do my swings. I mean, actually swing down with a cast blow. But I can't, uh, you know, I can't really move around other than the horse's movement. Uh, behind a shield, a lot of times, if I'm trying to protect myself from multiple opponents, I'm not, I don't have the luxury of trying to step with each cut and try to apply body, body weight to it or push the cut through, so to speak. So. I believe these are superior in power, it's just are they as good as the uh, screening type guns? You know, like when you're fencing. Well, of course not. It's not the same thing. It's not floss fetched. It. It's harness fetched. It. You're in armor. So a lot of times you're not going to be worried about trying to parry with a sword unless you have a really small shield and you end up in that situation hunting for niches or something. Otherwise, if you're trying to damage somebody through mail with a sword that's capable of doing that or cut into him where he's uncovered, like let's say, some cloth on his leg, you can slice straight through his leg, just like they speak about in the saga. All right, what I'd like to speak about is the cast, casting blow, the cast blow, like Rollo Wozeka speaks of. 
Oh. The SCA does something very similar to it. They are hitting for power and they're counting how much force goes through the arm, like what they feel. If it's solid, did it skip, how hard it hit. But to generate power, they do what they consider a cranking motion, which what that is, is they throw more of a straight kendo style shot out and let the blade do the work. If you're watching what I'm doing. So the idea of that is to streamline it to get to your opponent, to get the, the speed, to get that speed of the cut. And a lot of ways it's very much can be performed like the uh, screening cuts when you come in here. So you can use a uh, acceleration of the blade, you know, to get your cut, get you just cut a little sharp than having a full cast from, let's say a position up here, like in some of the drawings where they cast it out and just let the blade do the work. It's just streamlining it, it's the same thing. You're just pretty much throwing the blows out and letting the blade do its thing and recover. That's all it is. We'll go ahead and try to throw one here with the correct technique and I'll try to streamline it, maybe go straight to the target. Ah! All right, there was no chance of cutting through that with a push or draw cut in a conventional manner, like from a, a shrimp slack, like a screening cut or something. I doubt you would cut through this because it's not a body motion that's pushing the blade through. It's not a draw or cutting or pushing cut that's going through. It's the speed of the chopping or hacking motion from throwing the blade, the cast blow. And that's how we're doing the speed cut setting up like that with no pedestal. They were just sitting here like that. This piece was up here and we just went clean through effortlessly. I got a little excited about it when I did that one, but it's still pretty much effortlessly. You're just letting the blade do its thing and letting, letting your you hold tight at the back and letting your hand follow through. We noticed this on these type of pommels that uh, it seems like they're set up to do that. They're set up for cast blows. I don't think they were doing early period the transitional blades and the early Viking blades. I don't think they were doing much sword fencing. I think it was all shield fencing as Roland Morzeka says where the shield pushes the other shield, manipulates the other shield, and that's why the big, large, three-foot flat rounds with the center boss were very common. When you start getting smaller shields and domed shields, then you start seeing uh, wider uh, quillions and smaller pummels in the back, more like uh, Brazil nut, which can do both. I mean, there, some of them were designed where they can do screening-type cuts and uh, uh, sword fencing with larger quillions or cross guards. But, uh, they can also do cast blows as well when you have the Brazil nut pommel. So I think that that type of style stayed prominent for a very long period of time. In the late 1300s, 14th century, they're probably still throwing blows like this until they get into plate and so on where a heavy sword and just smashing the plate probably wouldn't do any good one hand. All right, now I'm gonna test out the uh, overarm throwing slide technique. That's what I call it, or the overarm slide technique. Uh, it's a lot like the cast blow that Roland Morzeka is speaking of that he's witnessed in different depictions and artwork from uh, the early uh, century swords, such as in the uh, Viking era and the migration migration era, the swords tend to be made that it looks like they're used for casting, cast out the blow, hold on with the back of the hand, and accelerate the sword, more or less the sword from the hand and the elbow, and just not even worry about body motion, just let the blade carry itself and do its own cutting, which is very efficient, as we can tell, and very powerful, just with the weight of the sword. Uh, right now, we're going to go ahead and try out my overarm throwing slide, which is to be used from behind the shield as well. Uh, it's a one-handed technique, and it allows the spear to slide out like it has been thrown and uh, control the throwing speed. So what I'm doing is I'm not using my body to drive this through here and plant and push. I'm going to literally throw the spear through our head and see how, how it actually does against our analog as well. Let's try that out, see how it works. I should have to... Ah! Now look at my hand. You can see here, if you look at my hand, I'm letting go of it. So keep my hand that way, I let go. And let's see what we got. That was just me throwing my arm. I wasn't using any body and I wasn't pushing the spear. I let the spear do its own work. You've got to hold directly into the stone. As you can see the blood coming out right here. Might not have as much blood in it as usual, but we have a hole directly into the stuff. That's almost no effort whatsoever. Ah! We have one more blood now, and we pierce the skull again. 
You can see it right there. That's my opinion, both of those are kills and it took minimal effort to pierce the skull. Exact sort of same idea. This is the cast flow where you can follow the shield line, but you get your full reach. Even the shield all the way out, I can reach the guy. If I were to have it in this kind of position, very little reach at the end of the shield. If I want to cut somebody out here, I can barely do it. I mean, I'd have to be right against it using this kind of motion. So the cast blow, if I do a cast blow, look at the reach I get past the shield, even with it fully extended. If I were to be pushing it out to push the guy back, I can still cut him. That's the beautiful thing about the cast blow. And they use three foot shields to a meter uh, in diameter. So what we'll do is to take that into account. I'll make sure I have full extension on the uh, shield and we'll try to do a cast blow over the head and see how it performs. Ah! Chopped right in easy with no effort. Let's give that a little more power and try that out. Next, we took the top of the skull clean off. So it's really good. Well, I hope you enjoyed the episode, and uh, I hope that it showed that the uh, cast blow or accelerated sword by allowing it to move. And throwing it out was very similar to the overarm slide or even the underarm slides possible where you cast the weapon out and let it do the work itself. And I hope that the video proved that uh, and showed that it's effortless. It doesn't take a lot of uh, energy. Uh, you can stay in a, a stationary position if necessary and still uh, throw damaging or devastating cuts or blows, hacking, chopping type weapons. So they'll clean through arms, legs, pierce skulls. Uh, even the spear, a normal spear being driven into somebody's head is difficult to pierce the skull. Not only bobs the head out of the way and nicks the skull. With the throwing slide, it actually pierces because it's traveling so much faster and has good initial impact to crack through and pierce the skull. And the sword, I, though they didn't look extremely devastating, but the blows were more than sufficient to kill the guy and I used very little effort. All I did is just barely throw the sword on the head and we got beautiful cuts and even cleaved a piece of skull off. So uh, I honestly think that early period, this is a very common method of use. I think Roland's correct in seeing this in all the depictions and the artwork, uh, the, the cast blow and the way it was used, and for uh, assessing that that's what these type of pommels were used for, the early uh, migration and Viking Age pommels, and them being tight actually aided in this technique, didn't hurt it in any way. And uh, the spear, uh, honestly, we've looked at that as well, and we find the depictions, and they show that uh, just as is plainly that the spear was used in a throwing slide and used the older arm more often, or at least it appears to be. Could have been used underarm too, and the slide can also be used. But we believe the weapon was accelerated and thrown out and controlled, and that way you get more initial impact speed of attack, and the weapon is in. You don't have it sticking out in front of you where someone can actually manipulate the weapon. And it wasn't necessary because you weren't actually sword fencing and at that time period, they weren't using the sword to fence with. More than likely, they weren't using the spear to fence with either when they were using the shield. They were using their shield to defend themselves with, just as they would have done with the, uh, the shield and uh, with the uh, sword, and they would have uh, used the shield to manipulate the other guy if they were in single combat by pushing in the shield, pressing his shield to open him up, uh, use different angles of the shield to get uh, different uh, angles of attack. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope I did a good job, Roland. I hope you enjoyed the video, and uh, Barbell.